In my distress I called to the Lord, and He answered me. From the depths of the grave I called for help, and You listened to my cry. You, you hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All Your waves and breakers swept over me, and I said, I have been banished from Your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. And to the roots of the mountains I sank down. And the earth beneath me barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit. Oh my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. And then verse 8, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And then verse 10, and the Lord commanded the fish and vomited Jonah onto the beach. Wouldn't you love to have been there when that happened? I don't know if that was a whale or a big fish. I mean, but if God is God, it could have been a, a sardine. <laughs> right? I mean, he could have just, uh, honey, I shrink, you know, shrunk the prophet. <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, <laughs> in, in the, you know, there's, a, if you watch enough television, you know that, it, especially these, crime shows, you, you've heard of the witness protection program, the um, government people call it WITSEC, and uh, they provide, if they, if they decide that your testimony is important enough and that you need protection and then, you know, maybe the mafia or somebody is going to come after you, uh, they will provide you $60,000 a year and, uh, and put you up somewhere. Now, I don't know what happens in the, in the, second year or the third year, but I guess you've got to kind of get on your feet after that. Now, this is interesting. You know, um, <laughs> Jonah made his own kind of witness protection program, but not because he had a testimony that he wanted to give, but it was because of the opposite thing. God wanted him to give a testimony, and Jonah didn't, didn't want to. And so he ran the other way in his own witness protection program program and I mean he found out the hard way as many of us have that you can try to run from God and the call of God on our life but we can't outrun God and we can't hide now when we last left Jonah he had been thrown overboard and swallowed by you know again what the text calls a, a great fish now, people are fascinated and think a lot about and write a lot about, maybe you've wondered, you know, what was going on inside of this fish? And, you know, did he, did, how, was there oxygen in there? Or, you know, how did Jonah stay alive? And, uh, you know, what sort of, you know, metabolic miracle had to happen where the whales or the great fish's juices, you know, like digesting his skin? There's all sorts of speculation. But the real story is not what was going on with the fish, but what was going on inside of the heart of this man, of this prophet of God. And in a real sense, Jonah is like every single one of us. It's a parable really about us. And it, it's kind of a satire. It's a book that we should read and, and just kind of chuckle and say, you know, hey, that's me. I've been there, been there, done that. Got the t-shirt, been spit out into the ocean with all kinds of goop on me. And, you know, all of us, in one time or another, have run from God in some way, in some form, or some fashion. Maybe you're running today. Maybe you're on the run because something you did in the past, you made a mistake, and um, you made it, and, and you're running from that, and you're hiding from it. And as Mei Ling said, you're not, you, you don't even want to talk about it. You don't want to bring it before God. You're ashamed to, to, to say that you won't forgive yourself or you won't forgive God. Maybe you're on the run because of a relationship that didn't work out. And it was your fault. And you're running, you're running from grief. You're running from God. By the way, never run from grief 
and never tell anyone under any circumstances not to grieve a loss, regardless of what the loss is. It's natural and healthy and good to grieve a loss. When you lose a friend, you should grieve a friend. If somebody comes up to you and says, don't come into agreement with grief in the name of Jesus, bring them up here, I'll slap them upside the head for you. People, grieve your losses. Because God is in that process to heal you. Grief is just a, 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 a station on the way to, to, to healing. And it's necessary. And be with people that are grieving. Don't, they're not looking for answers. They're not looking for you to solve it. They just want you to be there with them. And maybe you're afraid of doing something that you know. You're running because there's something that you know in your heart of hearts. And it's not just because somebody came up and gave you the off-handed prophetic word. But maybe they gave you that prophetic word and that prophetic word just sat there and it sat there and it just won't go away. And maybe you're running from that this morning. Or maybe you're running from God because like Jonah, you're so darn arrogant. And I feel I can say that because I, I can relate to that because I've been that way. Maybe you're so darn arrogant that you're determined not to do what He wants you to do. And I told you a little bit of my story of running away from the ministry and angry with God and mad at God and telling Him things like, why did you let me be in that particular church? Why couldn't you have allowed me to be over here? And then after that experience, saying to myself, I'm never going to go to a church again and and so forth and so on. That didn't last long. But, you know, maybe you're like Jonah, and Jonah ran because he was upset. After all, he knew better than God what needed to be done. Remember what the message was that God gave him? He said to him in, in the first chapter, I want you to go to that great city, Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, the arch enemies of really the world at that time. They were a, a cruel and vicious people. And I told you, you know, that it was tantamount to uh, God telling a, a Jewish person during the Second World War to go to Berlin and tell uh, Hitler that God loved him and had a wonderful plan for his life. And so we, before we begin to get judgmental about Jonah, we should understand just how heavy this call was. Go and preach to that great city. Tell them they have 40 days. And I'm going to destroy them if they don't repent, God said. And Jonah, no, he, he knew. He knew better than God. You see. You see, this is really at, at the core of the issue. Jonah... Jonah knew that those Assyrians really deserved some fire and brimstone. And who was, God to say, who was God to say otherwise? Now if we hone in on this, this is really a picture of a lot of the church, the evangelical church in America today. And it's interesting that in the depths of the, of the sea, as he is in the belly of this the whale. I want to say whale because that's the traditional thing and, and those are the little pictures that we saw, you know, growing up as kids. A whale. A whale. But did you notice that he prayed twice? We're going to take a look at those two prayers and see a little bit about that because interestingly, each Hebrew prayer, the word prayer is different the first time than the second time. But I began to say, what a picture of the church in America today. See, Jonah had an idolatrous view of God. In his mind, Jonah thought that his sense of righteousness and justice was above God's sense of righteousness and, judgment and justice. In other words, good people get blessed, bad people get nuked. And... Gosh darn it, the Assyrians deserve a nuking. And you remember what happened, we'll get there eventually, but he got up outside the city, set up his little chair, 
and just waited for it to come. And, you know, we kind of chuckle at this, but, you know, sometimes we, we project these very things as evangelical believers onto the world. But that wasn't the heart of God. Jonah was saying in his heart, God, you better line up with what I think or I'm going to find another God. And a lot of us take on that attitude. You know, pastor, if you don't start beating up on this particular people group, either, you know, liberals or Democrats or, or gays or, or Republicans or ultra-right, if you don't start beating, whatever your pet peeve might be, pastor, if you don't start preaching against sin, in other words, the sin that I feel comfortable against, because I know more than, you know, I'll find another God or another church where that's done. And we chuckle, but that happens every single day in the Church of America. This is the, really the very essence of idolatry. And I'm not saying that any of these groups don't deserve the judgment of God or that God, God is always judging. The judgment of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. But how about we come to the place where we don't try to project our desires and our prayers and just get with God and maybe God what do you have maybe God wants to maybe God wants to spare those vicious people in Assyria those headhunters those hateful imperialists that want to take maybe God has a plan for them to bring them to repentance but Job didn't want any of that he he wanted to run just like the prodigal son ran from his father he knew better how to run his life but there's an even greater lesson that we we learn in seeing Jonah run we learn that when uh, we see Jonah run not from God but to God now he runs right into the loving arms of a father and there's some amazing things here about grace that we're going to see in a moment now listen, this is a story about a God who is a God of the second chance. He will take us, no matter how long we've run, how far we've run, to what depths we have gone, what judgments there might be in our heart. He will take us where we are. And by the way, He'll bring us to the place where we begin to line up with what He sees. And our prayers will become His prayer. And our heart will become His heart. And His will will be done in our lives. You tired of running today? Some of you? There's three steps that are outlined in this passage of Scripture. First one, look to God. Look back to God. After Jonah's swallowed by the fish, he's now engulfed in total darkness and you know he's feeling the burning of those gastric juices in his skin and he's wrapped up in seaweed. You can imagine the stench. Man, I thought my house was smelling funny yesterday. My air conditioning went out and I've got this great big collie dog that's like a horse and whenever she gets a little humid, you know, it's, I, you know God gave me I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but an, an ultra-sensitive sense of an olfactory sense. And oh my goodness, let's bow our heads in prayer so our AC gets fixed today. <laughs> now look what happens in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. It says, from, the inside, from inside the fish, Jonah what? He prayed to the Lord his God. And he said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. And from the depths of the grave I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled around me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. And I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Now up until this point, Jonah and God were not on good speaking terms. His prayer life had broken down. By the way, that is one sure sign that you are on a run from God. 
It's just hard to pray. Because you know that if you come there into the presence of God, He may have something different to say to you. And you, you want to avoid that. You'll take everything else the Christian life has to offer, all of the trappings, all of the external stuff, but all that intimacy stuff, man, that's just not for me. That's usually a sure sign of somebody on the run. I know that very well because that was me. And I, I developed a very good sense of you know, protection against intimacy. I said that's for either sissy uh, Christians uh, or people that are overly sentimental. Or I had all this, I had a theology, man. I could have written a book on this. Until God put me in the fish for three days and three nights. Not literally. It was, la- it was a lot longer than that. Because I, I knew what God had to do. I had Him all figured out. And so now God has been speaking to Jonah all this time, but Jonah had quit speaking to God. That's the last thing in the world. He wasn't in the mood to pray. And here in the belly of the fish which is about as low as you can get, Jonah hits rock bottom. And when you're at the bottom, there's only one way that you can look, and that is up to God. And Jonah looked up. And what does he see? He says he prayed to the Lord his God. And it says he looked to the temple. It meant that he he turned his eyes, and the temple is just simply the place of of the, the presence of God. I, I, I don't think, I don't know, maybe God gave him a vision at that time, time of the glory of the temple. But basically God got his attention and he turned his attention back to God and he looks toward the temple. He looks toward the presence. Remember what he was running from? It said he was running from the presence. Another translation is he ran from the face of God. And now he's, God has a captive audience. In this place, when there's nobody else to turn to, there's always God to turn to. His door is always open. This is the essence of of the song that we were singing earlier, Freedom Reigns in This Place. The essence of that word freedom is access to the Father, access to the temple, access to the throne of mercy. Now this is interesting. It sa- he says here in verse 3, You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas. You hurled me. Or in the King James it says, Thou didst cast. But did God... I thought the sailors threw him in there. But he says, You see, you see this is a, the, the, such a healthy thing to come into to grips with. Jonah says, You hurled me. But it was the sailors. Remember the sailors, they start praying. Jonah wasn't praying. The the sailors were praying to their own gods, their own deities. And then when that didn't work, they start praying praying to Jonah's God. I don't think there was a real conversion there. I think they were just kind of adding, you know, the, the God of Israel, the true God, to all the other gods that they had. And when that didn't work, then, you know, finally, you know, Jonah admits who he is. And then they take him and they hurl him into the seas and... Instantly, it says that that great storm just stopped at that moment. But I find that fascinating. To see what's going on here is the sailors in our life, people. Listen. Because you may be at this moment in the belly of the whale, and you're looking, you're angry at people that put you there. You're angry because somebody has done something in your life and you're in the, in the belly of the whale you're in, in, in this moment and you know there's all sorts of things going through your mind about about the people that put you there but you see those sailors were just agents of God's will to bring about what God wanted to do I spent a long time angry with a pastor in unforgiveness until God finally showed me He was an instrument to bring about my will, Ralph, in your life. And who are you to tell me that I should have done it some other way?
And you know, this wasn't just a, a, a particular weather cycle that happened to create a storm at that particular time. God sent the storm. That's it. God, the Bible says God sent the storm. And if, you know, by the way, if that doesn't fit in your particular theology, then guess what? Your theology needs to change. Because God ain't changing. He sends storms in our life. And you know what it might be? Maybe that, those tough times that you're going through right now, whether it's a, a business reversal or you're in financial trouble or there's a relational conflict and, 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 and you, you think God is gone. You know, by the, th those aren't signs that God is absent. It's, it could be that it, it's a sign that God is saying to you, I'm here. I am here. I'm working in your life. The storm, the sailors, I, I brought this about to bring about in your life what I want done in your life. I want you to remember something. Sometimes those difficulties are signs that God is present and God is at work. Not that He's abandoned you. In fact, God never abandons you, believer in Jesus. Didn't Jesus make that promise? He said, I will never ever leave you or forsake you. And we had that confirmed to us this morning by prophetic words. He'll be with us. Now, it could be that your life requires multiple whales. <laughs> multiple days in the, you know, below the depths with all of his breakers and his waves crushing over you. And some of you, you know, as, as I said that, I looked and you, you're nodding your heads. I know what you mean, Pastor. I, I myself am a, I'm a multiple whale uh, survivor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. He will roll you and me with all of his waves and his breakers until we finally look to the temple, to his presence, and say, God, what are you up to? And it's in the belly that we get the, the belly of the whale that we get the revelation. Now remember the scene at the, at the foot of the cross as Jesus was dying. If there was ever a time when his closest followers thought that he was absolutely, completely absent, when they thought that God the Father had abandoned the Son and left them there to suffer and die on his own, if ever there was a time they thought it was at the cross of Calvary. Remember the disciples and how devastated they were about what was happening? And they knew, they were convinced that this was the Messiah. They had confessed Him as Messiah, but now here He is dying on the cross as a common criminal. Where is God? God, where are you? Where was God? He was in heaven. But he was also on the cross. That was God. Revealing his love. Revealing his passion for us. Paying the price. The next time you ask yourself, where is God? Just look up. Look to God. And you'll be saying, there is God. Like Jonah did. Now the second thing to do when you run from God and you get tired of running because really this sermon is not about those who run from God. This message is really about those who are really tired of running from God because let's be honest, we only run back to God and we get really tired of running away from Him. And so if you're tired and you're thirsty, there's freedom. There's access. Because at the presence of God, freedom reigns. You know, God had to bring me to that point in my life. Really, this is what has been going on in my life. And that prophetic word that was given about the last couple of weeks, it's, it's been a little bit more than that, but the weeks have really been intensifying. I had gotten to the place in, in this ministry where I was really trying to do it without God. And I thought, you know, just my busyness my pastoral busyness. God should recognize that and then bless it because just because I'm doing stuff and 
I'm rolling out stuff. And then I would get upset because, look at, God, look at all that I did, God. And, and where were you? You, you? you didn't bless that. So this is about those who are tired of running and want to run back. Are you ready to run back to the presence? From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord as God. And he said, In my distress I called to God, and He answered me. And from the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Now, it's interesting. Jonah would not pray from the bow of the ship. Would not have been a great place to pray. But here he is now, in the belly of the whale, people. Imagine that, in the depths of darkness. You know, with, at, he says that the roots of the mountains, you know, the Hebrews thought that the great mountains and the continents floated. That was their, their, their world view. He, he thought he was below that. He's below the highest. God's never going to find me. I'm done. I'm cooked. But it was, it's from the depths. You see, when God brings you to that place, it's because there's something in you, namely the Spirit of God that was placed in you, where deep will begin to cry out to deep. And then the mercy of God begins to break into your life. Several years ago when Hurricane Andrew rolled through South Florida and there was total devastation, next day a couple men were talking and as they were clearing out the, the rubble and one of them said to his neighbor, he said, I'm not ashamed to admit that I prayed last night during that storm like I haven't prayed in a long time. And I, I know people, I know some of you lived through that, and maybe you prayed like you never prayed before. And his friend looked at him and said, I'm sure the Lord heard a lot of new voices that night. What if God, what if God put that storm there for some reason? Jonah had shut his mouth up to God. He had completely silenced himself. Not even when he was asked to pray would he pray. He was stubborn. He was a pouting prophet, uh, determined to shut up. And you know when, but God has a way of making us speak up. God has a way of bringing those prayers out. And Jonah says, and he answered me. Verse 2. And he answered me. You see, when you look up, you'll find that God's there. When you speak up, you find that God will listen. If you acknowledge where you are, if you acknowledge how you got there, and if you would admit your responsibility in this. And I think this is what begins to happen. He said, God, I've been banished from your sight. Verse 4. And yet I will look again to your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. And to the roots of the earth, you, I sank down. And the earth beneath me barred me forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, O Lord. And my prayer... Now listen. The first Hebrew word for prayer can also be translated when Jonah says and it says and Jonah prayed to the Lord the first Hebrew prayer can also be translated judgment you see he was at a kind of a superficial level of prayer it was prayer but God had deeper prayer it was a prayer that you know he's considering situations he's he's judging things but God had and and by the way he prays that prayer and did God answer that right away no I mean, when do you think Jonah prayed that first prayer? I think the moment that whale swallowed him and he started sinking, I think at that point he started crying out to God. But God had three more days. And it said, I prayed to the Lord. But then after that he says, but I sank down. You see what happens? In verse 2, I, he, he prayed and, he, and, God, and God what? Verse 2, he answered me. Listen, this is an important point. Because sometimes... When you're in those belly of the whale moments, you will pray and you will think that there's no answer. But God did answer. You know what the answer was? I've got a little more depth. I've got to take you down a little further. Not quite done yet. 
You know, when I finally turned back to God to seek His face and to seek His presence a couple of months ago, when I got tired of ministry my way, when I got tired of laboring, when I finally said, God, you know, I want Your way, I want Your kingdom. At first, my prayers were really, you know, deep down inside, there was this, yeah, but, because I want you to, I want this to work. I, you know, I want my ministry to work. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, really our prayer life just kind of becomes about, you know, God, here's my agenda, here's my schedule, and would you put your blessing on it, God? We have to be careful, people. I think, you know, God is bringing us as a church body, I know He's doing this with me, and He's bringing us to a, a place of prayer where it's not about, here's what we're going to do tomorrow, would you bless it, Lord? Wayne Jacobson, who has a ministry, a live stream ministry, was once in a prayer meeting um, as a pastor. He's not, doing, he's not pastoring church anymore, but he still has this ministry. And they were in a meeting, and uh, one woman, uh, you know, they came to the time of prayer request, and one woman said, you know, uh, I've got a prayer request, Pastor. My, my daughter is moving in with a young man, and they're going to live together, and would you pray that that doesn't happen? And Wayne said, no, I can't pray that. And the woman was shocked. And everybody else in the meeting was shocked. Why can't you pray that? And his answer was very interesting. That prayer, I'm not sure if that's God's will. Maybe God's going to take that person. Now here's where we, you know, we get black and white as Christians. I'm not saying it's right to shack up. Pastor Ralph said it's right for two people to live together. <laughs> They'll take that little snippet and put it on the internet. But how do we know that this young woman now who is clearly disobeying God and she knows it isn't about to be put into a very specially crafted fish where God will bring about His purposes? Wayne said very aptly, a lot of our prayers are like witchcraft. We begin to ask God for things that are not really His will. Boy, that busted me upside the head. Because, you know, my children have made their decisions... Your kids make your decisions. You make your decision. For God to just sort of usurp your free will and say, I'm going to take you this way no matter what you want. No, that's not the way God works. You see, a loving Father of the universe wants you to take you to that place in the depths where you will cry out to God and you will say, Lord, you know, what, what, what do we want? I mean, you know, and Wayne went on to explain a little bit. Do we want, you know, a, do you want your daughter to be kind of robotic and just obey? obey you because it's the right thing, uh, because it'll make you happy, first of all? Or do you want somebody, somebody who'll say, I want the best that God has for me, and I know that this living situation is not the right thing. Listen, this is why it's so important more than ever to pray Scripture. Because when we pray Scripture, we know that's the will of God. The, one of the greatest revivals in history, I've been reading about the Hebrides revival, and it's really ruining me. And it was just these two little old ladies in their 80s. One was arthritic. The other one was blind. Who were grieving because there were no young people in the church. 1949. They decided to get on their knees at 10, 10 o'clock at night. And they would pray from 10 to 4. And their prayer was Isaiah 44, verse 3. Verse 2 or 3. Where um, God says, I will send rivers upon dry land. I will send rivers in the desert. I will send streams in the desert. I will bring water where there is no water. I will bring the Spirit of God where the Spirit of God isn't. And boy, this triggered something. I wish I could go off and tell you the rest of it, but i got another point to give you. <laughs> and I know that this is a divinely inspired point. So I started praying that prayer the other day, and I just think, God, would you bring your water Begin to water, God. Bring, bring water over this thirsty city. There's no hunger. There's no spiritual desire for you. There's no appetite for God. Father, would you begin to send your rains over Doral? And I, I had a vision at that moment that I wrote down and I journaled. And it was like, you remember the temple in Ezekiel that's described, you know, the, the water flowing from the temple? I saw water flowing from the temple of God over the streets of Doral. You know, if we started praying God's prayers, 
for our city, for our families, for our nation. What might happen? The outcome of the Hebrides revival was just unbelievable with no programs, no nothing. People just... I'll tell you more later. <laughs> so Jonah prays the first time and God says, I got you. I, you got to go a little deeper. Go a little deeper. I got to sink you to the roots of the mountains. You're not deep enough. I got to wrap a little more seaweed around your head. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you down to the depths of the pit. And then he said, and when my life was ebbing away, when finally there was nothing else to turn to in me, when all of me had died, when all of my ideas and all of my good plans and all of my ways of seeing the world, and you know, I've got it all figured out kind of mentality. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, O oh Lord. And my prayer, now this is a different word for prayer. This is tehillah. It, the um, NLT, the New Living, translates it as earnest prayer. Tefillah, it rose to you, to your holy temple. To your holy temple. To your holy temple. Could God be crushing your soul just to create a purity in your heart that now begins to cry out to Him. In chapter 6 of Genesis, we, we see that verse where there was this, the earth was just a mess and sin was rampant. And it says at the end, and, and in those days, men began to cry out to the Lord. Third point and the last one is give up surrender he's a lot bigger than you Jonah has really come full circle look how he closes his prayer hang there with me we'll be done soon those who cling to worthless idols this is interesting why is he talking about idols will forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. What a turnaround. All it took was three days in the belly of a whale. <laughs> Why is he thankful? Why? He's singing, you know, he's singing in the belly of the whale, praising God in the worst moment. God will squeeze a song out of you. <laughs> Maybe it was like, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> and it's not because God had delivered him from the fish. He was still there. Here he is thanking God in the midst of the worst moment of his life. And it's not because God was going to deliver him from the fish. He didn't know whether God would or not. At that moment, he didn't know whether that was going to end or not. He thought, you know, I'm dead, but I'm going to be thankful. I'm in this place, God. I am turning to your temple. I am going to complete the vow that I made. I will praise you. I will bless you. No matter what. There was a, a surrender going on here. Whether he lived or died, he was going to do what God asked. He made a promise. When he made a promise to God, he was going to keep it. He praised him. You see, what's happening here is he's turning back to the face of the Father, where God is enough. God is enough. Not, not his salvation, not his deliverance from the fish. Notice this, because a lot of us won't come to that point, and we, we, we say, well, this doesn't work. I'm still in the fish. I'm still losing my home. I still don't have the job I want. My kids are still rebellious. You know, my husband doesn't have the prayer life I want. I'm, my, my, my life, I've, I'm, I'm under pressure. So it doesn't work. But why is he thankful? He's thankful that he was back in the, in the good grace of God. Now I want to tell you something about that grace. You see, because... 
when you turn to the presence of the Father, that's the end. That's not the means. We don't go to the presence to get what we want. We go to the presence because it is what we want. We just don't know it enough yet because of the idols in our heart. Seeking God's, morph, seeking God's face is not an end to a means. We don't seek God's face to have better results in ministry, to get more of an anointing, although that probably will happen, or to preach a better sermon, that probably will happen. All God ever wanted for Jonah was to completely give up. You see, in the belly of the whale, Jonah is finally at Sabbath rest. In the depths of the ocean, he prays. See, when God brings you to this place, He's thorough. He, he's complete. Remember what happened when the nation of Israel... I'll just tell you the story quickly. In chapter 14 of Numbers, they were one year outside of Egypt. They had been delivered a year before that. They come to the edge of the place where they're going to cross into the Promised Land. Remember the spies are sent in. Only Joshua and Caleb come back with a good report. The others are, you know, no, we can't do this. You know, God, I know you said we can, but we can't do this. And remember what happened? Moses intercedes, and, you know, for the nation, and God decides to forgive them and not destroy them there. Remember what happened with the people? They said, oh, no, no, but, but, but we can still do it. We're, we're going to go in there. And God forgave them. God forgave the nation for that sin of unbelief. But the people said, no, we're going to carry this out anyway. Read Numbers 14 and 15 later. And remember, they went into the land, and what happened? They were destroyed. They were devastated. They were sent back with, you know, their tails between their legs. You know why? Because God wasn't done yet. God had another 40 years of discipline for that nation. The three days weren't up yet. They begged God to change His mind, but He wouldn't. Because there was still a lesson to be learned. You see, you'll remain in the belly of the whale until God is done. And you will love it. (laughs) Jonah's prayer life went from one level to a much deeper level, from judgment to an earnest cry in verse 7. For an earnest cry. You see, listen... Jesus knows when you are seeking Him or seeking answers to your prayer. This is a heavy. This, it only took me 32 years to learn. Maybe you'll be quicker. Oh, you will be quicker. You're not as hard-headed and arrogant as I am. Jesus says... I know when you seek me and I know when you seek me for things. You see, so when you come to the place where you're seeking Him because He is your desire, He is your portion, and He is what you want, and not because you really need something over here. I'm going to fake Him out a little bit. You know, we'll start with about five or ten minutes of worship and, you know, and... Now that maybe that might be creating a little stress in you. Because you think, man, I, that's me, but how do I get out of that? Give them time. Just keep coming. Keep coming. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Why would Jonah be talking about idols right now in the context of the situation? There aren't too many around in the belly of a whale, right? He wasn't clinging, clinging to idols, was he? Try the boat. Try Tarshish. Try sleeping through the storm. There were a few of them. Idols are anything that we run to in moments of distress that's not the presence. Anything that we use to bring momentary comfort instead of sitting in the presence of the Father face to face, that's an idol. What do you run to? TV? Drugs? Liquor? Jokes, you want to joke your way out of it. Cigarettes, porn, entertainment, 
food. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace of God. I want you to put your finger on, if you've got your Bible, put your finger on the word grace if you have your Bible. And this, is, this really is the last point I'm going to make. But this, this is a key thing here. Grace. Forfeit the grace. In Hebrew, it's the word chesed. And a lot of times it's translated grace or loving kindness, but it's really an untranslatable word. Uh, the great... Um, Translator of the King James Bible, Miles um, Cloverdale, Cloverdale, something like that. He came up with a word in the King James. He made up that word, loving kindness. We used to sing that song, Your loving kindness is better than life. That's a good way of translating chesed, but it doesn't quite get there. It, sometimes it's translated mercy, favor, kindness, but really these are things that are outflow chesed. Uh, the best way to understand it and, and go about this grace that we're forfeiting when we cling to idols, the best way to understand this is that this is God's special covenant love for His people. It's a word that combines love and loyalty, undying loyalty. It Really, the best way to translate it is love that will not let go. Love that will not let me go. And God's love, people, will not let you go. It won't let you go in the depths of the sea, in the belly of the whale, in the darkest moments. He's there. He's there. He's there. A great rabbi in the 11th century, his name was Rashi, commenting on the word chesed, he said that God gave precedence to the rule of mercy and he joined it with the rule of justice. But this much is clear. When we try to estimate the depth and the persistence of God's loving kindness and mercy, we must first remember His passion for righteousness. God is righteous, right? He's righteous. He's also merciful. Now here's what this rabbi said. He said, His passion for righteousness is so strong that He could not be more insistent in His demand for it. But, God's persistent love for His people is more insistent still. It's deeper still. His passion for you is deeper still. Love that will not let you go. And I want to end with this. Jonah said, I have vowed what I have vowed I will make good. You see, you know you're at the end of the rope when you as a believer what did you vow when you first came to Jesus you remember when you first came to Jesus you were ready to do it you were ready to go to the ends of the earth you secretly wished he wouldn't send you to China but you would have gone there if he had told you to go to China or to the depths of Africa you would have gone there because you were in love with Jesus and what you vowed at that time what Jonah had vowed when he first began to follow God as a prophet of God. God is now saying, He's now saying before God, I'm going to make it good. What did you vow? Wasn't it just a simple, beautiful thing just to follow Him wherever you would, He would take you? And then what happened? And then your life got really complicated. And then things began to fill it. And then your life became about holding on to things and thinking that you couldn't let those things go because they mattered And even as God was ripping it away from you and saying, I have much more from you, you clang to it and you clang to it and you wouldn't let it go. But God won't let you go because His chesed, His loving kindness is better than life. It's greater than even His sense of righteousness. Not His sense, His righteousness. And He defines what that is. People every day that we run from God is a wasted day. Run to God. Run to His presence. Come to the throne of Hesed, of loving kindness. See, that's, that's the word that the, Hebrew, the author of Hebrews was thinking when he said, come to the throne of mercy to obtain what? Grace in time of need. Loving kindness. His loving kindness is better than life. 
God is driving you to that place where you said, what I vowed, I will promise. Back to the purity. Back to the simplicity of Jesus. I want you to hear a story. This is a true story of a man who sank to the depths of the, of the ocean in the belly of the whale. I'm not going to say his name, but I'm just going to read his story. And it begins by saying, I'm an alcoholic. I've been incarcerated for over seven years. That's the belly of his fish. I have never, but I have never felt freer in my life. My nephew, and this is a story told by somebody, this is his nephew, goes on to share a gut-wrenching, heartbreaking story of how he began to drink. He went through job after job, and he was discharged from the Air Force and began to collect DUIs, the first one and then the second one and then the third one. By the time he was married, he had a wife and two beautiful children, but the drinking continued. Then in June of 2002, while on his way to an AA meeting, while changing lanes on the expressway, he hit an SUV, causing it to go out of control and flip. And a 14-year-old boy was ejected from the SUV into the middle of the road. This man panicked and he left the scene. He stopped at a convenience store. He got drunk. He was finally arrested. The 14-year-old boy died. Sitting at that jail, he said, and I'm quoting, it was at that moment that I had realized that I had a problem and I was completely powerless over my alcohol addiction. I broke down crying. I was broken. I, someone who would never consider owning a gun, had just murdered someone. All I could do, it was all I could take. That was the moment I surrendered fully to God as I asked Him to remove my addiction. I couldn't fix my, uh, myself and I was tired of trying. I was tired of running. But I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ for the first time. And truly for the first time. And almost immediately I felt an overwhelming sense of true peace. A peace that I had never known before. I was given a 15 year sentence. And I know in some ways that I will serve my sentence for the rest of my life. Nevertheless, I never, I, I never, found, in my, I never found my true freedom until I was imprisoned. It has been more than seven years now, and I'm grateful. Grateful for what? That he found at his lowest moment that when he looked up, God was there. God was there. And when he spoke up, God heard his prayer. And that when he finally surrendered, God would take him 